Ethics and the Vice Rector of the Angelicum, the Pontifical University of St. Thomas in Rome. She is also a member of the uh, Pontifical Academy of Social Science and a consultant to the Dicastery of the uh, Promotion of Integral Human, human Development. And um, I got to know her in uh, another preaching project, um, Preaching Justice. Um, and it's my pleasure to have her here now, sharing her thoughts with us on uh, the encyclica of um, Pope Francis, um, Laudato Si, and uh, the arts. Um, because in her research, she uh, mostly looks at the role and impact of ethics and Christian social thought uh, in the fields of management, sustainability, and um, increasingly also artificial intelligence. I wonder what Dominican thoughts she will share with us on Laudato Si and arts. Welcome, Helen. Thank you very much, Hannah. Yes, Hannah was a very important contributor to a project that we ran uh, a few years ago on uh, Dominican contribution to social ethics in the 20th century. She wrote a very important contribution for that project. So thank you very much, Hannah. Thank you very much to all the organizers. Um, I'm very happy to be with you in this uh, virtual sense. Um, there's quite a lot about technology in uh, Laudato Si. Um, so it's kind of appropriate in a way. I think it's also appropriate to talk about Laudato Si on Sunday as well, because it's um, there's a lot about celebration and rest and the importance of not being too frenetic in our lifestyle in the encyclical. Um, I gave this subtitle a dialogue, uh, basically because Laudato Si wants to be a document of dialogue. You can see a little quote in the bottom left-hand corner. Um, I would like to enter into dialogue with all people about our common home. Um, and the document itself talks about dialogue quite a lot. There's a whole chapter which is really about dialogue in it. So uh, I think dialogue is also interesting um, because of some connections I'll make later uh, with a, an early event we had this year called Preaching and the Arts. Um, and some echoes I'd like to bring from that into this meeting today, which made me want to talk about a dialogue between Laudato Si and the arts. The image you may know, um, it's uh, of a sculpture done by an unknown artist. You can see the background is Rio, so we're in uh, Brazil. There was a UN meeting going on um, and the artist produced these two very striking fish made out of empty plastic bottles. So I think it's quite an appropriate image for us to start off with. Um, I'd like to give threefold structure to this uh, short presentation, um, partly because the number three is very important uh, in the encyclical too, we will see that. Um, and also it, it allows us to follow this medieval structure, which is about dialogue really, learning through dialogue. Um, when we think about the way people uh, disputed questions and um, in many ways academic life was much more dialogical then than it is now. Um, <clears throat> so um, in the, the first part I would like to say something about dialogue and use two Dominican uh, witnesses uh, on that point. Uh, the first witness is Dominic Pierre, um, he's a confrere of Anna, Belgian, Dominican, um, the only one only Dominican ever to have won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1958. Um, there's a very beautiful text he's written about dialogue. I want to quote something from that. Um, and then move up to our present day, Michal Paluk, who's just finishing as rector of the Angelicum. Um, and he, uh, I will quote from a, a talk he gave last year. Um, and of course, he's from Poland. So we've got uh, two figures here from the two lungs of Europe, if you like, as, Tom, as uh, Pope John Paul would call them. Europe breathes with two, two lungs, he would say. 
And, and the reason for doing this partly is because uh, we see here a lot of unity between these two statements. We can see they share basically the same position, but they give different emphases. So apart from helping us see more deeply what dialogue is, it's also about unity and diversity at the same time. We can see that in these two figures. Um, then I'd like to say just a couple of points linking Laudato Si and the arts mission here. I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. Then get into the main meat, which is to give you a short kind of overview of Laudato Si. Um, it's the, it was the longest social teaching encyclical ever written until Fratelli Tutti. Pope Francis managed to write an even longer document in Fratelli Tutti. Um, so it's difficult to do that. But uh, anyhow, I, I hope I can pick out some of the key points in the dialogue with artists. That's, that's the aim of doing it. So to open up the dialogue, to give some illuminating text. And then there's a little footnote at the end, which I think is quite illuminating if we are looking at this um, document in the view of dialogue. And then finally, the respondio is just uh, to share with you two works of art, uh, one um, of which was inspired by Laudato Si. We'll see a short video about that. And the other one is uh, organized, or was one of the members who, who produced this work of art um, is in uh, the mission with us now, Sergio Catalano. I think he's going to be in the next session after me, which would be good because he can correct anything that I might say about his work of art, just not correct. Um, but I put this here, okay, because it's done by Dominican, but also because it's on the theme of justice, which is a pretty, a pretty important topic for Laudato Si and for Catholic social thought in general. Okay, so <clears throat> the uh, two Dominican voices. First of all, Pierre, um, I just need to move the position of this, excuse me. Yeah. To dialogue means to look beyond the boundaries of one's conviction and for the duration of the dialogue to share the heart and spirit of the other without abandoning any part of oneself. I think that's the crucial sentence of this quotation, to share the heart and spirit of the other without abandoning any part of oneself. So these two things, and he goes on to say a bit more about it. In order to understand, judge, and appreciate the real goodness and usefulness present in the thoughts, feelings, and actions of the other, one must really fill oneself with the other. It therefore requires one to put oneself, who we are and what we think, between a sort of parenthesis, to appreciate the other positively without necessarily sharing the other's point of view. So again, we see in that phrase, a re repetition of what he just said, to appreciate the other positively without necessarily sharing the other's point of view. And then in this, there is a profound self-sacrifice. So I think it's a really um, challenging statement for us uh, regarding dialogue. It's not a surprise that this is a person who could do so much using this kind of approach that he could win the Nobel Peace Prize. So it's a very high standard for the dialogue that he's setting for us here. But you can see there's this sense that these two things must be held together, this openness to the other, but also uh, not abandoning yourself. And I think that's the self-sacrifice. You know, if you just let somebody walk over you and and you don't keep in the, in the, on the ball, on the table, uh, your own position, um, it's easier in a way. The difficulty can be keeping together what the other person is saying and what you have to offer, especially if they are different or even contradictory. Okay, so that's the first voice, that's Pia. Um, If we go now to Palo, second voice. So this is from last year, and it was a talk given with the title, John Paul's Proposal for Europe. And, and as he says, this proposal was the invitation to rediscover its strong Christian identity. 
So it looks like in this, we're starting in quite a different position from Pierre, but, but let's carry on. But the way in which the Polish Pope tried to put this proposal into practice showed that it will be a re rediscovery of the truly Christian identity only, only if it is combined with respect for the other, interest in dialogue, and capacity for self-questioning, recognizing one's own failures, weaknesses, and injustices. So here again, we have this sense of identity, but there's a sense in which this identity needs to be always purified. Uh, we can only rediscover it if we also recognize our failures, weaknesses, and injustices. But then he carries on. Such an attitude allowed John Paul II to make a warm place for the other inside of his own religious tradition. It seems um, of great importance for me that this warm place, very beautiful image, I think, warm place to receive the other, respectful and full of interest for the other inside of the Christian tradition should be made not in spite of a strong Christian identity, but only because of it. So I think we have here two voices that are substantially saying the same thing, but they are putting a different emphasis on the two elements of it. One is the openness to the other, the warm place here, the, the putting yourself in parenthesis that Pierre says, and, and the other is not abandoning your own identity as Pierre says, and as, as Paluk is saying, uh, rediscovering your uh, identity, which includes rediscovering your failures, weaknesses, and injustices. So I think one of the things we see here is how much pain there can be in dialogue as well. It's not an easy process. And just to balance that, I would like to have this short quotation from John Paul, um, his address to UNESCO, which in fact, Mihao used in his talk, as well, because I think this gives a more positive side of dialogue. So he says, although the concept of dialogue might appear to give priority to the cognitive dimension, dia logos, all dialogue implies a global existential dimension. Dialogue is not simply an exchange of ideas. In some way, it is always an exchange of gifts. So that's a also a beautiful sense of the positive side that we are giving and receiving gifts. And gift is actually quite important in Laudato Si as well. Okay, so the second and last part of the proemium, um, two elements to this. First is to read with you and reflect on a quote from the actual text of Laudato Si, which I think brings together the key elements of this session and this whole meeting because in paragraph 80, Pope Francis quotes from Thomas Aquinas, so we've got a Dominican there, actually a text that's not very often quoted, I don't think. Um, and it's talking about art and it's in Laudato Si. So we've got all the elements really here, the key elements. And I'd also like to look at it because I think it is a key into the text of Laudato Si and brings us to consider what I think is the primary um, or the most profound critique that Pope Francis is trying to get across in that document with regard to why we've arrived in this crisis position with regard to the environment. So let's read it together. Nature is nothing other than a certain kind of art, namely God's art, impressed upon things, whereby those things are moved to a determinate end. It is as if a shipbuilder were able to give timbers the wherewithal to move themselves to take the form of a ship. Okay, so I think for people who are involved in artistic production, this is quite an interesting comment. Nature is nothing other than a certain kind of art. And what kind of art? Well, God's art. And how does God produce art? Well, he impresses a determinate end on things. He moves things to an end. And 
you know, that's rather Thomistic philosophical way of saying it. He then gives an example, try to fill it out. Uh, the shipbuilder or the shipwright um, gives a form to timbers by putting them together and turning them into a ship. A ship has an end. Uh, so the, the, he creates something by giving it an end. And that's, you know, what artists would be doing too, I think. So there's a big point here about art being connected with an end and the creation and nature being connected with an end. Um, and a bit later in the text, Laudato Si has this phrase, which I think is worth reflecting on. We have too many means and only a few insubstantial ends. And I think that's, I think we can all see that now. We are extremely advanced in terms of technology, our economies are the most productive the world has ever seen. We have enormous amount of infrastructure. We have very, very uh, advanced systems of um, uh, policy making, so on and so on and so on. So we have a huge number of means. He says even too many means almost, uh, and only a few insubstantial ends. Um, and I think not talking about Laudato Si at this point, but reflecting more in general on this, we could ask the question, why? Why have we got here? Um, and I think to say very briefly, um, it's because of a, a, a side effect or a bad effect of, of a synthesis that had a good goal at the beginning in the 1700s when it was put together, the Enlightenment synthesis, driven partly by historical factors, also by philosophical ones, which try to put human freedom at the center of our way of living. And the mechanism that was devised for doing this, uh, to stop human freedom creating social chaos or, or a lot of violence on the social level, was to separate the ends of life, what everybody thought their life was about, the really important things, why our life is, is what it is, to separate that out, put, move that to the private sphere. So of course, religion is supposed to be moved to the private sphere too. And then in the public sphere, in the social or the political sphere, the piazza, the square, we only talk about the means. We talk about how we're gonna produce enough uh, money or enough products or the way we're gonna treat each other, laws, policies, so on. Those are the things that are to be discussed in social sphere, in the public sphere. And then we create enough means so that each individual can use their free will to achieve their own goals that they think are important. Now, you can see there's a lot of benefits to that kind of system. Uh, it, it's not certainly all bad, but it has some negative effects. One of which is that the ends, because they are pushed to the private sphere, become completely unimportant and not considered when we're thinking about how we create the means, how we run our economies, how we run our social life. And, so it's not a surprise that we've ended up now with too many means and only a few insubstantial ends. That's actually a kind of product of the system that has been running things, uh, at least the dominant part of the world since the 1700s. But now we have to start talking about ends. You know, the Pope uh, quotes the Earth Charter. The first thing it says is we have a common destiny. We share an end. We cannot carry on not talking about this. Um, and in fact, we now have a series of sustainable development goals, which I'm sure at least some of you have heard about 17 of them that were uh, agreed in the same year this document was produced. Um, and, and I think more and more we will see as part of trying to deal with the climate crisis and uh, trying to confront the problems that this massive emphasis on means and forgetting about the ends has, has led us to, we're going to see more and more discussion about ends, which probably means we're going to see more discussion about religion too in the future. 
And I think, you know, that can make people feel scared. You know, when they think about religion coming into the public sphere, they think integralism, you know, what's happening in some Muslim countries now? And that, that seems scary. I think it does seem scary to us because we've all inherited this system uh, that in some ways has some benefits, as we say, but it's, it's side effects, it's collateral effects are now completely unsustainable. We have to start thinking about our shared ends. Um, so this quote allows us, I think, to get to this really important point, which I think is at the basis of Laudato Si. And then the second and last part of this opening um, comments is some echoes from an event we had in the Angelicum called Comunitas 2021. It's our interdisciplinary interfaculty conference that we try to have every year. And this year, because of the Dominican Jubilee, we, the topic was preaching and the arts. And many of the people here in, in the Italian arts mission were also involved in this, not uh, by any means the last person, Alain, uh, who gave the opening talk. And the echo from his talk, which I would like to bring into this session, is, is this painful relationship between artists and the church, which he talked about, and, and I think very rightly so. Um, and, and the pain that was here, we already talked about the pain that we can have in dialogue, um, just facing this pain and thinking about it. And we will also see in Laudato Si, there's a lot of pain that's being discussed. So that's a connection. Sergio Catalano, uh, we already mentioned him, had this lovely phrase, art subspecie predicationis. I just want to launch that um, lovely term at this point. And then Mihao, in his opening words at the beginning of the, of the main conference, talked about the partnership between preaching and the arts. And like a lot of partnerships or relationships in general, it's quite a tough one in some ways. And we, we're trying to bring these two sides of the relationship together, but not necessarily making it very well. And he talked about how preaching on its way to fulfillment glimpses art. I think that's a lovely phrase, trying to meet art, but may not make it. Similarly, art will never be fulfilled without the courage to preach, to say something. Um, so, okay, these are some opening comments. So now we get to Laudato Si itself, on care for our common home, that's the uh, subtitle. You can see it's got six chapters. It starts off in the introduction with Pope Francis going over what previous popes have said about the environment. Um, John the 23rd, Paul the sixth, uh, John Paul and Benedict. And then it comes up to, to my appeal, as he says, my appeal, which is to bring the whole human family together to seek a sustainable and integral development. And, and a very important figure in that uh, introduction is St. Francis, not a surprise, his patron saint of his pontificate, a, a constant point of reference for him. He, he talks about how Francis would see each and every creature as a sister united to him by bonds of affection. And, and later on in the encyclical, he will talk about how Bonaventure, Bonaventure, reflecting on Francis' life, will say that in some ways he kind of um, recovered orig original in excuse me, an original innocence. It's almost as if he goes back before the fall and, and finds a, a healthy relationship with everyone, with, with God, with the, with the nature and with others. Uh, and, and in that sense, he's a, a sort of patron saint for the whole uh, approach to environmental healing and, and dealing with the crisis that we face. So chapter one is, um, if you think about the classic Catholic social thought approach, which is see, judge, act, um, chapter one is the see part of the analysis. What's happening to our common home is the title. And he starts off by talking about how change is going so fast he actually coins a new word um, to, to talk about it, a neologism, uh, rapidification, he talks about. And he's contrasting the way we change compared to the slow biological 
changes. Now, he's saying change is desirable, we're not opposed to it, but we have to be able to know whether it's damaging or not. And if it's moving so fast, that can be difficult to know. And so some of the damaging um, changes he talks about, we know very well, pollution, climate change, and so on. One of the important things he says is that the human environment and the natural environment deteriorate together. Um, we have a bit more here on the illuminating text slide, quote from paragraph 49 about that. He says, a true ecological approach always becomes a social approach. It must integrate questions of justice in debates on the environment, so as to hear both the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. Now, if you're following sustainable development questions, you won't find this very, I think, very striking um, right now. It's well established now since the, social, the sustainable development goals were, were set up um, that we should always think about human development and environmental protection as, as going together. But until 2015, when, when this document was written, there was, they were usually contrasted against each other, and hence why it's very important in this document that they are put together. Um, you know, often people who were concerned about the development of poorer regions of the world, for instance, were attacked by env environmentalists, uh, saying that, you know, trying to develop um, these countries means more pressure on the environment. Um, and so one of the big steps forward has been to find a way of thinking about development, which is both humanly um, important and environmentally sustainable. Okay, the second chapter, the gospel of creation, I think the main thing he's trying to do there is to show how faith can illuminate our understanding of the ecological crisis. And I want to talk about, I think four, if possible, if I have time, four ways in which faith can illuminate our understanding of the ecological crisis. The first one is on this slide, when he talks about the root of the problem. And he says quite simply, the root is in sin. Um, now that's a kind of illumination that faith can give us. Uh, we wouldn't get that word sin out of a scientific approach or other kinds of approaches. It's really um, a fruit of a faith perspective to be able to say that, to name it, to identify it. And what is sin in this, in this context? Well, he tells us it's in the breaking of our threefold relationship. So it's the breaking of a relationship. That's the sin. And it's threefold. You know, we said three was going to be important with God, with each other, and with nature. And of course, in the biblical uh, accounts of Genesis, we see, first of all, the break with God. But very quickly, we see the break with each other. Cain and Abel, uh, we see going on from there, constant problems. And now we're seeing in a very clear way in our time the break with nature so it's the, the sin is carrying on having its effect in our damaging us in in our world um there's also here on this on the illuminating text slide a quote from the encyclical i'd like to mention um nature he says is usually seen as a system which can be studied understood and controlled so nature is usually seen scientific way, or maybe economics will also think about it like that. Studied, understood, and controlled. Whereas creation is a bigger term. You can only understand creation if you add some extra things. So this is illumination coming in from faith. Creation can only be understood as a gift from the outstretched hand of the father of all, and as a reality illuminated by the love which calls us together into universal communion. So you can see again, he's showing this illumination of faith is putting together um, the sense of importance of nature as a gift, something we have received, something we have um, been given, um, and also the need for human beings to work together towards universal communion. And that the, the same gift Behind it, we can see the love of the creator who is calling us into universal communion. So we have this 
this sense of the good of the nature and the good of our human community coming together. Again, it's important in the context historical period that that was emphasized by him and the faith undergirds it. A few other small points on Sabbath and the Jubilee. This is important, he would say, because it allows us to break this frenetic uh, emphasis we all have on creating the means, working all the time, producing things. We, we stop these things to celebrate, to experience the goodness of things. Um, and I'd like to say a word about the Jubilee. Um, as you probably know, biblical scholars say it probably didn't ever happen in reality, even though it's in the biblical text, the seven weeks of the seven years, so the 49 years, followed by the 50th Jubilee year. Um, one of the things, of course, that was supposed to happen is that the original owners of property would be given back their property, which they might have lost during the 49 years because of bad management or, or problems, you know, unexpected problems. So they would receive back their property. Well, you can imagine how the rich and powerful in society would never want that to happen. They would stop that from happening. Um, and it, indeed, modern economists would say, if you, if you suggested something like this, probably most of them would say, absolutely out of the question. Nobody will invest in the future if they're going to lose the value that they have um, gained from their, or they're looking for from their investment if they thought, you know, 50 years from now, I'm just going to lose it. You know, it would, it would take away all the incentives for us to really grow and develop our economy. Um, but I've got a friend who's um, an economist in Geneva. He's actually Polish from Polish background. Um, and he uh, talks about how financial crises are rather like uh, the Jubilee of the Old Testament, but without all the good aspects of the, of the Jubilee. Why? Because of course, when we hit a financial crisis, all the values of things collapse. There are some people who do well out of a crisis, but most people are damaged by it. There's big losses that people sustain. And because crises are very, very damaging, there's a lot of study of the history of financial crises. A lot of historical effort has been put into trying to understand why they occur and to try and stop them occurring in the future. Um, but despite that, we don't manage to do it. Uh, the historians reckon um, that about every 30 years, we have a financial crisis. Um, and some would say it's even less than that on average. But anyway, let's say 30 years. Uh, well, 30 years is less than 50 years. <laughs> and and the, the, the thing that's really bad about a financial crisis is you don't know when it's gonna happen. And people are really damaged by that, by the uncertainty of it. So it's almost in, in terms of faith illuminating things which are um, you know, natural order, we could say that maybe the Jubilee is actually something we should seriously consider. First of all, because it actually gives a longer period before everything collapses, but it's also managed in a way that's not so painful. It has a kind of significance for us too. You know, I mean, I think the Jubilee could become a real economic proposal in the future. But anyway, that's just my, my ideas. Um, the demythologization of nature is important from a faith point of view because it kind of stops us thinking about the earth as a kind of a god or goddess. We hear that a lot in, in the world today and increases our responsibility for taking care of the earth. And then the last important point I think I would raise from that is the gaze of Jesus in this last part of the uh, chapter two, um, in which he, he has a rather a uh, nice uh, discussion about how Jesus brought the lilies of the field and the birds of the air into his preaching. He, he, he recognized the beauty that was around him and, and brought that into his, his teaching um, and also talks about his work. Um, he says, Jesus worked with his hands, connects also with the artists, in daily contact with the matter created by God, of course, by him in that sense. Uh, to which he gave form by his craftsmanship as a man. It is striking that most of his life was dedicated to this task in a simple life which awakened 
no admiration at all. And, and that's one moment where John, um, sorry, Francis um, is trying to emphasize these things which awaken no admiration at all are really important. He's trying to encourage people to do things which seem pointless in the face of this looming catastrophe that we, but these small things that attract no admiration at all can be extremely important and significant as they were, of course, in the life of Christ. So it's part of him trying to give hope and courage and just to, to help us face this, this crisis. Okay, there's a lot of other interesting things in the text. We, I think I should start to um, move on. So I won't say too much about other chapters. I'll move to the last chapter um, where he, we have the title, Ecological Education and Spirituality. I think he uses the word education quite um, uh, specifically there because he wants to connect his text to the massive education systems that we have in the world today. You know, he could have used another word there, but I think he wanted them to make the connection with education um, and, and bring these ideas into the educational system. So there's lots of things he says we should do. The one I think I'll focus on is ecological conversion, which is an idea, of course, that he gets from uh, John Paul II, but he adds another one to it. He talks about community conversion. Um, and we might see this as a sort of parallel to the structures of sin that uh, John Paul talks about in his social teaching, that just as we need to have a conversion on personal level, we also need a community conversion. Um, and there's another very beautiful text I'd like to quote there from paragraph two, 117 is actually quoting Benedict XVI at that moment, where he says, the external deserts in the world are growing because the internal deserts have become so vast. Um, so it's as if the environmental crisis that we're facing now, the, the enlarging of these deserts in the world, it's a physical manifestation. It's a sort of external representation of the deserts inside us, um, our own brokenness. And so without this conversion, this is the faith again, illuminating uh, the ecological crisis, we can't necessarily hope that we can really deal with the external deserts. We need to have uh, this healing that he talks about towards the end, a spirituality, which is Trinitarian, of course, because it's about relationships. It's about contrasting those broken relationships that we talked about at the beginning, the sins which are leading to the ecological crisis. And I just want to finish with this footnote. It's a footnote to one of the paragraphs on the sacraments, footnote 159, and it talks about the arts. So that's one reason why I want to mention it here. But uh, I also have another reason, which if you know uh, who wrote this, you will know why I'm mentioning it. So let's just read it together. Prejudice should not have us criticize those who seek ecstasy in music or poetry, as opposed to perhaps religious belief. There is a subtle mystery in each of the movements and sounds of this world. The initiate will capture what is being said when the wind blows, the trees sway, water flows, flies buzz, doors creak, birds sing, or in the sound of strings or flutes, the sighs of the sick, the groans of the afflicted. Well, it's a quotation. It's obviously written by someone who's really able to use language, even in the English translation, it sounds beautiful. In the original, it must be quite extraordinary. Very beautiful the way it links the sounds of nature with the sound of music and then the sounds of suffering, sick and the afflicted, um, that these can all speak to us. Um, now, that is a beautiful quote to think about in terms of the arts, but it's also very interesting that it's, it was put as a footnote to, as I say, the discussion on the sacraments. 
because if you don't know who wrote that text, I can tell you that it was written by a 16th century Sufi poet, um, Ali al-Hawas. Um, and uh, as you may know, it's the first time, as far as I know, that any Islamic text is quoted in a papal encyclical, but it's done in a very intelligent way because it's done in a footnote. It's not in the main text. It's not too threatening to people. Um, but um, it's also, so it's in that sense, it's not too threatening to the Christians, um, uh, but still it's trying to create a bit of a warm place to listen to the, the Islamic tradition, making a space within Christian identity for this other identity, beginning to do that anyhow. Um, but it's also, I think, a challenge to the Islamic tradition because it's a footnote to a paragraph on sacraments. So it's, it's raising the question about incarnation, about God's relation with the world from the Christian tradition too. So I think it's a very, very intelligent thing that he did using this text in that way. Okay, so now this is the last part of our uh, meeting together. Um, Uku is kindly now going to take over and uh, connect to this video um, about this work of art that was directly inspired by Laudato Si called The Living Chapel. Thank you, Uku. La Living Chapel è un'installazione che unisce natura, arte, musica e architettura e ispirata all'enciclica papale Laudato Si, all'Agenda 2030 delle Nazioni Unite per lo sviluppo sostenibile. Nasce da un'idea di un compositore musicale che si chiama Giulio Andarius Revi ed è ispirata e proporzionata sulla porziuncola di Assisi. Nello specifico questa struttura che abbiamo qui all'Orto Botanico è una struttura che è completamente autoalimentata e la musica viene suonata da un gioco d'acqua. La Living Chapel ci fa ricordare, come ogni cappella, che tutta la terra è la, è la casa di Dio di cui Papa Francesco ha parlato anche nel messaggio per la giornata di preghiera per creare il primo settembre, che questa terra è casa di Dio perché Dio stesso nell'incarnazione eh, si è fatta carne su questa terra. La Living Chapel è sostanzialmente un progetto di riforestazione che ehm, persegue no, le indicazioni anche delle Nazioni Unite nella Trillion Tree Campaign e quindi diciamo, noi abbiamo come missione quella di andare a piantare alberi. Lo facciamo attraverso la creazione di giardini laudato sì o attraverso la piantagione di alberi in aree degradate delle città ad esempio. Quindi attraverso diverse associazioni, e cattoliche e non, stiamo eh, distribuendo gli alberi a questo proposito. Cioè chi viene qui a prendere un albero deve davvero aver voglia di far crescere quest'albero, quindi di curarlo e di farlo diventare grande, insomma, e di poterlo lasciare alle generazioni future. La cura del creato è un tema universale. Qui la, il sottotitolo dell'enciclo Laudato Si potrà aiutarci. Il sottotitolo è sulla cura della casa comune. Allora, tutti noi abitiamo in questa unica casa, possiamo essere cristiani, musulmani, buddisti, ma siamo, e poi come diceva, dice anche già, già San Francesco di Assisi, la terra è madre. Noi come cristiani crediamo in un unico Dio Padre, abbiamo un'unica madre terra e per questo siamo tutti fratelli e sorelle. Allora 
è un bellissimo, la cappella Laudato Si potrebbe essere un simbolo di questa fraternità di cui adesso abbiamo anche il docu dell'enciclo di Papa Francesco, proprio sulla fraternità per dire che siamo tutti fratelli e sorelle e una famiglia con sei fratelli e sorelle prendiamoci cura gli uni gli altri. Okay, thank you very much, Uku. So that's one uh, uh, work of art that's connected with our topic. Now I'd like to turn to Sergio Catalano's, uh, the, na the name of it, In Nomi della Giustizia, Luci per la Memoria, um, is obviously connected with the question of justice. It's an installation which was put up in the, the Church of Dominican Friars in Palermo, 23rd of May, for one day in 2016, which was obviously a jubilee year for the Dominicans as well, but also uh, the year of mercy. So it was an important um, year of jubilee in many senses. And it was put up on the day, the uh, Giornata della Legalità, as it's called in Italian, the, the day of respecting the law or keeping the law, we'll probably say in English. And it's a very significant, of course, for a part of the country in Italy, Sicily, where Palermo is, of course, where criminality is a big, big problem. The, the contrast against the mafia is a major issue for the people. So it was about uh, an artwork about this, And um, you can see here in this image, um, part of what it involved. There's a very big banner. There's actually two of them, one on either side of the main altar, going from the heavens, if you like. You can see it going down to the earth. Um, and uh, there's writing on that banner, which you can see a bit better in this picture, giving the names. These are the names Uh, of people who have been killed by the mafia, who refuse to give way in front of mafia criminality. So they stood up for justice, they're witnesses for justice. Um, so all their names, I think it's a very amazing thing to see that this idea, this great scroll going from heaven down to earth with all their names. If you think about the names of God, that wonderful a lot of writings about that in the medieval period as well. All kinds of ideas we could have from this. And then of course, the next thing is the lights, the lights uh, uh, in memory of them, but also remembering the light of their witness. And you can see it allows the people to be involved in this work of art. As we know, a lot of installations, it's very important that the, there should be participation in them. So you can see in, in these two pictures, the people, placing the lights and the lights are moving down from that great scroll with all the names moving down the church towards the uh, main entrance the doors are wide open so that's all part of the the structure and then here we can see prayer going on um, by the lights themselves and in front of a tomb this tomb is a very important one because it's of Giovanni Falcone, who was one of the leading lawyers prosecuting uh, the criminal, uh, who, criminals who are part of the mafia um, and who was killed in 1992. And you, you may also remember that Pope John Paul made a very, very strong reaction to this as a result of which the mafia set off bombs in Rome as well. So it's, uh, it was a very, very important figure Falcone, and he's buried in the Dominican church. So the, the significance of the, the work of art is, is enhanced, of course, and strengthened by the fact that his tomb is there and the people are praying there in front of his tomb and are with the art uh, um, inspiring them. So these two last images just give you a sense of the overall um, structure of it, the, the, the great scroll and the lights coming down, which are kind of small and insignificant, each one of them on their own, but together form something great. Of course, 
I should say there was also music being played at the same time, the organ was being played, so that had, it had an auditory element to it as well, this um, installation. And you can see the lights going out, so the message is being taken out into the piazza. Uh, so of course, a strong preaching element to it in that sense, um, in this work of art. So of course, Sergio can say more about it if he wants to improve on what I just said. So that's really where I want to end. I don't want to conclude because I think of this as a dialogue that's ongoing, it should have echoes in our lives as we go on. Um, and, and it will hopefully we have maybe have some discussion now so we will continue this dialogue, but even beyond that. So thank you very much for your attention and um, I'm happy to discuss anything with you. Thank you, Helen. Uh, it was really, really inspiring. You led us away um, with Laudato Si to remember that we are able to form, to create a warm space, a warm place for the other um, without sparing us that there are uh, painful aspects in this dialogue. And um, especially when we are starting to uh, speak with one another again, uh, remembering that we share the ends, that this gives another importance to everything we do. Um, and the beautiful, uh, the really beautiful um, examples of how art is enacting all of this. So I'm sure that there are questions or comments, uh, and I can see already a hand raised. Alain, would you please? Thank you. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Sister Helen, for your talk. Uh, I'm Brother Mary Augustine from Helsinki. I hope you can see me. I see my own image here. Yes, I'm there. Okay. <laughs> uh, at two points in your, uh, in your talk, I was reminded uh, of, uh, of the work on pluralism by William Connolly, uh, especially at the beginning when you uh, presented the idea of dialogue uh, being loaded with uh, uh, humility and uh, uh, dialogue as truly dialogal, and, and again, uh, when as a footnote, uh, I can't remember the name of that Sufi poet that you mentioned, and the idea of a flow, of art as a flow, and as being taken in the flow, it reminded me of Connolly because he explores uh, that uh, idea uh, of, uh, of the flow, especially of our own uh, thought process as being a flow, and no thought uh, is forever uh, set in fixed words, uh, never changing, and that entering a true uh, dialogue with someone should acknowledge, should start by acknowledging for oneself that our own thoughts are uh, always in, in a flow, actually, and that we can change and we can shape them in another way. And all of a sudden, uh, those words by that Sufi poet uh, opened to me the idea that art is truly a metaphor for that, that should make us especially in the process uh, of uh, theology, uh, of making theology, of uh, explaining the, the dogma and the, our doctrine, that it's always uh, in the making. It's always in the making. And uh, I really trust that uh, it should make us more humble and meek in the way we, we present things. Well, actually, it, it joins a concern of mine, a question of mine, of uh, making theology really in a dialogal way, uh, uh, honoring and taking really into account what comes from from other uh, fields of knowledge, from other uh, subject matters, and and art as a metaphor for for that for that process with the idea of a flow uh, is something that you, your talk has opened me to. So I want really to thank you for that. It's more uh, a comment than a question. But if you have something to echo and to add on that point, I'll gladly uh, hear it. If you have some uh, more words about it, thank you. Well, I'm very encouraged to hear these reflections because it's exactly what I hoped would happen <laughs> as a result of this session, that, that this is such a, an all-encompassing topic and it's uh, got many, many elements. So there's a lot of room for 
difference and diversity within a shared position, I think. And, and the more, especially through the work of artists, we can, we can bring this out. I think it's, it's uh, so helpful. So, you know, Mary Augustin gave a different perspective, but you can see the connections with what I said, um, just as you could see the connection between Pia and, and, and Paluk. And, and I think this, this sense of, um, you know, you, you gave another one, you know, a, a, another way of thinking about how to hold together both a really profound kind of existential openness to others, which is uh, what uh, Pia was talking about, you know, putting yourself in parentheses and like, or, or, or uh, Mihal Palop was talking about in, in the, the, the warm place for the others. You talked about it as a flow you know, and, and so there's a sense in which there's dynamism in this. It's, if those that images are sort of a bit static that they gave, which are very good images, but different from the ones that Connolly is talking about and that you were talking about, and that help us have another view of what dialogue is about and how we can bring the Christian tradition in a way to, to the world of today, in a way that makes sense to them. I think we also need to think about it, you, you were saying about it too, that um, you know, we're coming out of a phase of history where it was kind of normal that no religion should be talked about uh, in many ways. And we, I think we're moving into a phase now where religion is becoming much more present. There's all kinds of dialogues going on, all kinds of levels, European Union, UN, um, and, and even just the mere presence of Pope Francis with us is, is another. So I think we need to find ways of having this dialogue with people who are not believers and yet they need to hear what we have to say. And that's our identity and, uh, and, and not abandoning ourselves importantly in, in the dark, of feeling the pain of that to accepting that it's difficult to do it, do it well and to, to experience that difference. You know. So thank you for your comments. Bonjour, Sora Elena. Merci. Ah, wow, Sergio. <laughs> Grazie. <laughs> Merci pour uh, uh, avoir uh, utilisé uh, le travail que nous avons fait avec uh, uh, mes collègues architectes à Palerme. Quand je, tu m'as demandé uh, d'utiliser, de, j'étais très ravi. Uh, ce qui m'a beaucoup uh, touché, c'était la remarque que tu as faite uh, en regardant l'œuvre toutes les œuvres, mais en général, l'œuvre euh, par rapport au dialogue, c'est-à-dire euh, l'œuvre a donné euh, cette image de d'être capable. Ok, excusez-moi. Les Italiens parlent trop vite en général. <laughs> I must translate for the for the English speakers. Um, so Sergio Catalano, who was responsible for this installation in the Church of Palermo, um, uh, greets uh, Helen and is thankful for the uh, for the mentioning of, of the work of art, which he realized with architects uh, during the Jubilee year in 2016. Um, si je peux ajouter quelque chose, c'était le fait que uh, cette installation à Palermo nous a donné m'a donné la possibilité de euh, entrer en relation avec beaucoup de gens et beaucoup de monde. If I may add something is that this uh, installation gave me the opportunity to enter into dialogue with many people. Et, parmi eux les associations qui s'occupent de euh, cette euh, si j'ose dire combat euh, contre la mafia. Et, et beaucoup des étudiants euh, que vous avez vus dans les images euh, des, des écoles de Palerme. Such as uh, groups who are involved in uh, combating and struggling with, uh, against the mafia and also uh, students and teachers uh, of Palermo. Euh, ça c'est ça m'a donné la la possibilité de me plonger dans le dialogue, dans un véritable dialogue humain, tout d'abord, ensuite intellectuel, artistique. La question que j'aime te poser, c'est le fait que tu es un, un, un enseignant à l'Angelicum, et, et donc tout euh, rapport avec les étudiants, avec euh, les théologiens, avec euh, ceux qui vont, euh, viennent à l'école. 
And this allows me to uh, really enter into dialogue with uh, with this uh, these people, and it was a very fruitful dialogue. Now, the one question I would like to ask to you, uh, as a professor of the Pontifical Institute Saint Thomas Aquinas in in Rome. Um, eh, eh, le dialogue dalle colle, dall'angelicum, eh, dalle eh, ehm, ehm, se è possibile, c'è-à-dire, eh, come ehm, tu esperimenti, ehm, tu entri dal, dal dialogo quando tu fai dei cours, eh, se si ci ha ehm, un veritabile risultato eh, da questa dinamica? As a teacher at the Angelicum, uh, when you when you teach, uh, are you able to enter to real dialogue with the students? Et enfin, quels sont les résultats de cette dialogue intellectuelle, si je veux dire? And what are the results of this uh, in intellectual dialogue? So, thank you, thank you, Sergio. Well, um, I think it's uh, very, very important for those of us who are involved in education. Uh, that we should be thinking in a dialogical model. A lot of education theory shows that people learn more if they are participating. So um, we can do various kinds of things. Um, I can give you some examples. Maybe that's the best way to do it. Uh, um, I, one of the courses I teach, for instance, is history of Christian social thought. Um, we have a special course on Catholic social teaching, that's different. So I'm looking at all these people, various figures who are not popes, <laughs> who have contributed to the tradition of social reflection and action in the church. Um, and this means usually that I have to do a course because it's historical, mostly focused on Europe, because the that's where most of the action was taking place until very recently. But many of the students in front of me are not from Europe. So what we always do is each one does a little project on some figure or some groups or some problem that's been addressed in their home country. And they always bring that into the course. And so you can see, like we saw with Pierre and Paluk, you could see the same problems, but being dealt with in historically different ways, conditioned ways by the historical trajectory and the cultural um, uh, situation that's dealing with it in their country. So they are bringing, it's an exchange of gifts in that sense. They're bringing something into the classroom from their own tradition. They're learning more about their own tradition and then bring it into context with other uh, voices, you know, like the teacher's voice, but also other voices from other members of the class. So that would be one way in which we try to create this dialogical um, relationship in the classroom. I think it would be very good if we talked more as a teaching body about how to do that, because I, I guess that that's, there's other really interesting ways that other people are doing that I don't know about. So, you know, it's a really good question you put to me. It makes me think we should, we should do that. And I think we will try to organize it. So thank you for that. If there are people online listening to us, so they can also put their questions to the um, uh, little uh, conversation box or question and answer box, and we shall relay them to uh, Sister Helen. Um, there's another question here. Uh, thank you, Sister Helen, uh, for your talk. I find it really relevant because I'm a biologist. Uh, so thinking about this, I was wondering uh, between, you made this parallel between nature and creation, this uh, like different views on both. And I was wondering, like we as scientists have like a, difficult task on how to respect nature like the boundaries uh, and, and controlling nature like because there's some uh, for instance ad scientific advancements that really want to improve the quality of life of people but sometimes they go very beyond that boundary so I don't know if you have some like advices on us scientists to not really go beyond that uh, boundary of what God has given us as a gift and maybe we shouldn't like go like very further on that because I find some some people doing for instance uh, 
um, trying to push, um, let's say, um, I don't know, human's life as, as long as possible, but I don't know how ethical is that. So I don't know if there are some like guidelines that you can like maybe um, show in like, or how can we reach to these like considerations between uh, to as a guideline to or as scientists to work with, uh, let's say diseases or uh, increasing the the life, life lifespan of people because you always say increasing this life lifespan would be beneficial for most of us but maybe it, which which is the the limit there uh, this is a, just an example and a second question maybe this is too long uh, maybe i could like afterwards uh, yeah, i could like uh, have, find this answer but may, maybe i'm not that familiar with um like the parallel you did between the um, uh, jubilee and the economical crisis that for, for me it may be so obvious for most of, of the attendees here but not for me so i don't know if we, you can a bit develop further on that I, I was very curious about this thank you thank you for two really good questions so um when we're talking about scientific research which is what you're talking about i think here um in a in a sense you say there's this uh, problem about limits. In a sense, the scientific research is about pushing the boundaries of knowledge, finding things out. When you're, when you're talking about the uh, lengthening life, in a way, you're talking more about technology there than science, because the scientists are creating knowledge about how uh, life expectancy can be uh, increased, but then we have to actually use that knowledge through technical means to actually make people's lives longer. So I think, first of all, we need to make a distinction between science and technology there. I mean, sometimes the scientific research itself, we might say, has got ethical problems. Uh, for instance, say, research on embryos um, that, that leads to their death, it's not for their good, it's for just for us to learn things about embryos, these kinds of things where we're not respecting the, the, the ends of human life. Um, and, and that would be, that's taking me to the, the, the topic, which I think is the key one for science now. You know, science has become the, the kind of um, endeavor it is uh, now as part of this enlightenment project that we are all benefiting from, but suffering from also at the same time. And, and so one of the things we need to do is to bring back into scientific research and especially into technology, which is the use of science to change uh, our situation, that what are the goals and ends of human life? And, and you know, why are we here? You know, it's a hard question to answer, which is one of the reasons why people don't want to deal with it. You know, and we, we're coming out of 300 years, more or less, 250, 300 years, where we basically said, look, that is a question for religion. That is a question for individuals. This is a question we don't deal with in the public sphere. So we've sort of lost the capacity to deal with it. So it's tough that this kind of dialogue between religion and science in that sense is tough. We have to learn how to do it. You know? um, and I think we learn how to do things by doing them to some extent. So, um, you know, we, in, for instance, in the topic pontifical universities, we have to try to train people who can talk to technologists, who can talk to scientists. We have to try to um, help um, in the training of experts to give them some language in which they can think about things. For instance, we're gonna run next year a, a second semester one semester program, intensive program on Catholic social teaching and related subjects. And it's for people who are doing master's degrees and doctorates in completely different subjects. And the idea is they will come to Rome, they will really get an intensive sort of injection of this thinking. And then they can try to bring it back and use it in their doctorates on AI or their medical doctorates or all the other kinds of subjects. So we have to, you know, we as a university and Catholic universities in general, one of our big roles is to try to promote this dialogue, um, to try to help scientists to, to 
be able to talk about and imagine um, how they can contribute to achieving the ends of human life, you know, which is kind of a new thing. We haven't done it for all these hundreds of years, but we could. And I think if we're really going to take the environmental crisis seriously, if, if Laudato Si is really right, we're going to have to do this more and more, even though it's a bit scary for people to think about that because they feel like it means we're going to stop moving forward. It's going to be a shutdown. There's going to be an inquisition. There's, you know, all that. There are fears there which we have to face and, and overcome. You know, and some of the fears are not, you know, without some grounding, you know, if we look at history. So um, I think that's my kind of answer to you. I think the main thing is we have to reintegrate all these specialized disciplines that we have, all these specialized forms of knowledge, like biology, you know, like physics, um, but also the humanities and that. They have to be integrated into a vision of what knowledge is for, what life is for, what's the goals, what's the ends. And if we can start to do that, then we can start, I think, to talk in a serious way about what you're talking about, the limits to things, because then the limits make sense in terms of what goals we're trying to do. It's not just stopping us from doing things because it's wrong. It's about achieving the real good, the real good, which is a, associated with achieving our real ends, you know? It's, I may be not saying something to you that's too easy to understand, but that's because we have, don't often talk like this, I think. We're not used to it. And that's part of the problem that Laudato Si is bringing up to us, you know? So we in universities and we who are professional people like biologists, and that, we have our role to play also in helping us to think and dialogue in a different way. Um, and the kind of thing that Sergio was asking about, how do you bring it into the classroom, you know, and, and, and that kind of thing, um, in order so that we can deal with these problems, you know, at every level, because it's a problem that's affecting us in many ways. That you also asked about the Jubilee. Um, well, my, my point, which is a little bit tendentious, I don't know if anybody here is an economist who might, an economist might disagree with me, but um, what I was trying to say is that we, if the historians of financial crises are right, and there are a lot of them, and there is a lot of work that has been done on the history of financial crises, because people are so concerned about financial crises, they want to find out why they happen and stop them happening in the future. Okay, so there's a huge amount of work that's been done on this. The, 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 the general consensus is we have a crisis about every 30 years, and we don't manage to stop it. It's almost as if it's something that we can't not do. Um, we, we, we keep doing this, however much we study it, however much we, there's a basic problem there, probably to do with greed, probably to do with the root in sin. As, as, and we can't just deal with it by having a better system or better uh, processes or, you know, that's not getting to the root of the problem, probably. But anyway, um, we don't need to go into the whole thing about financial crises now. But my point was to say a financial crisis in many ways does to the economy what the, what the Old Testament Jubilee did to the economy or would have done to the economy if it was ever practiced in reality. Because it means that um, people lose a lot at the time of the Jubilee, partly because there's a massive redistribution that goes on. Now, in the Jubilee idea, the property would go back to the original owners. You know, over the 49 years, a lot of people um, would lose their property because they wouldn't manage it properly, or there'd be some kind of drought or illness or something, which meant that they became uh, destitute and they had to sell their land to, you know, there could be all kinds of reasons for why they didn't have to. So they have to go back. Now, I'm not saying we, we would actually do this now because how would we do it? I mean, but this idea that we could have a sort of programmed, prepared kind of um, uh, stop in a way to the economy where we, have, we celebrate what is, what is good, what is important. We re-try to reapportion um, some of the wealth. I mean, I don't have a proper proposal because I only just started thinking about it. Um, when thinking about this talk, 
Um, but it just seemed to me, thinking about what Pavel Dombinsky had said to me um, once before, that the financial crisis due to the economy, very similar thing to what the Jubilees would have done to the economy, uh, but without all the positive effects, he said. You know, so the, 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 we, instead of having this crisis thing which happens, which causes so much damage, to have something that's programmed that we prepare for and that has a ritual side to it. And that, you know, it, I don't know. I mean, I maybe shouldn't have said it because I don't have a proper proposal for it, but it was just in the spirit of the dialogue that I, I brought it up. So thank you for two good, very good questions. Well, uh, thanks to everybody for the questions and for the dialogue. And uh, special thanks again to Helen. Um, for sharing your thoughts and uh, for being with us with the help of Technik. Um, let's have a little break and continue our journey in dialogue. And I uh, would like to uh, use the last picture of your presentation, the way of the lights. Let us become witnesses of this dialogue through art and through our daily life. Thank you very much. Thank you, Helen. Should I leave? You can stay. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. If you're hungry, you can go. <laughs> Okay, bye, bye, Helen. We're going to carry on. Thank you very much. See you in the room. Come on. It is hot, probably.